April brought a kind of madness to the country folk and began that disuse of the road past Noms which led to its ultimate abandonment. It was the vegetation. All the orchard trees blossomed forth in strange colors and, and through the stony soil of the yard and adjacent pasturage, there sprang up a bizarre growth which only a botanist could connect with the proper flora of the region. No sane, wholesome colors were anywhere to be seen except in the green grass and leafage, but everywhere were those hectic and prismatic variants of some diseased, underlying primary tone without a place among the known tints of the earth. The Dutchman's breeches became a thing of sinister menace, and the blood roots grew insolent in their chromatic perversion. Ami and the gardeners thought that most of the colors had a sort of haunting familiarity and decided that they reminded one of the brittle globule in the meteor. Nam plod and sowed the ten-acre pasture and the upland lot, but did nothing with the land around the house. He knew it would be of no use and hoped that the summer's strange growths would draw all the poison from the soil. He was prepared for almost anything now and had grown used to the sense of something near him waiting to be heard. The shunning of his house by neighbors told on him, of course, but it told on his wife more. The boys were better off being at school each day, but they could not help being frightened by the gossip. Thaddeus, an especially sensitive youth, suffered the most. In May, the insects came, and Nam's place became a nightmare of buzzing and crawling. Most of the creatures seemed not quite usual in their aspects and motions, and their nocturnal habits contradicted all former experience. The gardeners took to watching at night, watching in all directions at random for something that they could not tell what. It was then that they owned that Thaddeus had been right about the trees. Mrs. Gardner was next to see it from the window as she watched the swollen bows of a maple against the moonlit sky. The bows surely moved, and there was no wind. It must be the sap. Strangeness had come into everything growing now, yet it was none of Nam's family at all who made the next discovery. Familiarity had dulled them and what they could not see was glimpsed by a timid windmill salesman from Bolton who drove by one night in ignorance of the country's legend. What he told in Arkham was given a short paragraph in the Gazette, and it was there that all the farmers, Nom included, saw it first. The night had been dark, and the buggy lamps faint, but around the farm in the valley, which everyone knew from the account must be Nom's, the darkness had been less thick. A dim, though distinctly luminosity seemed to inhere all the vegetation, grass, leaves, and blossoms alike, while at one moment a detached piece of the phosphorescence appeared to stir futuristically in the yard near the barn. The grass had so far seemed untouched, and the cows were freely pastured in the lot near the house, but toward the end of May, the milk had begun to be bad. Then, Nom had the cows driven to the uplands, after which this trouble ceased. Not long after, this change in the grass and leaves became apparent to the eye. All the verdure was going gray and was developing a highly singular quality of brittleness. Ami was now the only person who ever visited the place, and his visits were becoming fewer and fewer. When school closed, the gardeners were virtually cut off from the world, and sometimes let Ami do their errands in town. They were failing curiously, both physically and mentally, and no one was surprised when the news of Mrs. Gardner's madness stole around. It happened in June, about the anniversary of the meteor's fall, and the poor woman screamed about things in the air which she could not describe. In her raving, there was not a single specific noun, but only verbs and pronouns. Things moved and changed and fluttered, and ears tingled to impulses which were not wholly sound. Something was taken away. She was being drained of something. Something was fastening itself on her that ought not to be. Someone must keep it off. Nothing was ever still in the night. The walls and windows shifted. Nam did not send her to the country asylum, but let her wander about the house as long as she was harmless to herself and others. Even when her expression changed, he did nothing. But when the boys grew afraid of her, and Thaddeus nearly fainted at the way she made faces at him, he decided to keep her locked up in the attic. By July, she had ceased to speak and crawled on all fours, and before that month was over, Nam got the mad notion that she was slightly luminous in the dark, as he now clearly saw was the case with the nearby vegetation. It was a little before this that the horses had stampeded. Something had aroused them in the night, and their neighing and kicking in their stalls had been terrible. 
there seemed virtually nothing to do to calm them, and when Nam opened the stable door, they all bolted out like frightened woodland deer. It took a week to track all four, and when found, they were seen to be quite useless and unmanageable. Something had snapped in their brains, and each one had to be shot for its own good. Nam borrowed a horse from Ami for his haying, but found it would not approach the barn. It shied, balked, and whined, and in the end he could do nothing but drive it into the yard while the men used their own strength to get the heavy wagon near enough to the hayloft for convenient pitching. And all the while the vegetation was turning up gray and brittle. Even the flowers, whose hues had been so strange, were graying now, and the fruit was coming out gray and dwarfed and tasteless. The asters and goldenrod bloomed gray and distorted, and the roses and zinnias and hollylocks in the front yard were such blasphemous looking things that Nam's oldest boy, Zanis, had cut them down. The strangely puffed insects died about that time, even the bees that had left their hives and taken to the woods. By September, all the vegetation was fast crumbling to a grayish powder, and Nam feared that the trees would die before the poison was out of the soil. His wife now had spells of terrific screaming, and he and the boys were in a constant state of nervous tension. They shunned people now, and when school opened, the boys did not go. But it was Ami, on one of his rare visits, who first realized that the well water was no longer good. It had an evil taste that was not exactly fetid, nor exactly salty, and Ami advised his friend to dig another well on higher ground to use till the soil was good again. Nam, however, ignored the warning for he had by that time become callous to strange and unpleasant things. He and the boys continued to use the tainted supply, drinking it as listlessly and mechanically as they ate their meager and ill-cooked meals and did their thankless and monotonous chores through the aimless days. There was something of stolid resignation about them all, as if they walked half in another world between the lines of nameless gods to a certain and familiar doom. Thaddeus went mad in September after a visit to the well he had gone with a pail and had come back empty-handed, shrieking and waving his arms, and sometimes lapsing into an insane titter or a whisper about the moving colors down there. Two in one family was pretty bad, but Nam was very brave about it. He let the boy run about for a week until he began stumbling and hurting himself, and then he shut him in the attic room across from his mother's. The way they screamed at each other from behind their locked doors was very terrible especially to little Merwin, who fancied they talked in some terrible language that was not of Earth. Merwin was getting frightfully imaginative, and his restlessness was worse after the shutting away of his brother, who had been his greatest playmate. Almost at the same time, the mortality of the livestock commenced. Poultry turned grayish and died very quickly, the meat being found dry and noisome upon cutting. Hogs grew inordinately fat, then suddenly began to undergo loathsome changes which no one could explain. Their meat was of course useless, and Nam was at its wit's end. No rural veterinary would approach his place, and the city veterinary from Arkham was openly baffled. The swine began growing gray and brittle and falling to pieces before they died, and their eyes and muzzles developed singular alterations. It was very inexplicable, for they had never been fed from the tainted vegetation. Then something struck the cows. Certain areas, or sometimes the whole body, would be uncannily shriveled or compressed, and atrocious collapses or disintegrations were common. In the last stages, and death was always the result, there would be a graying and turning brittle like that which beset the hogs. There could be no question of poison, for all the cases occurred in a locked and undisturbed barn. No bites or prowling things could have brought the virus, for what live beast on earth could pass through solid obstacles? It must be only natural disease. Yet what disease could wreak such results was beyond any mind's guessing. When the harvest came, there was not an animal surviving on the place, for the stock and poultry were dead and the dogs had run away. These dogs, three in number, had all vanished one night and were never heard of again. The five cats had left some time before, but their going was scarcely noticed since there now seemed to be no mice, and only Mrs. Gardner had made pets of the graceful felines. On the 19th of October, Nam staggered into Ami's house with hideous news. The death had come to poor Thaddeus in his attic room, and it had come in such a way that could not be told. Nam had dug a grave in the railed family plot behind the farm, 
and had put therein what he found. There could have been nothing from outside, for the small barred window and locked door were intact, but it was much as it had been in the barn. And Ami and his wife consoled the stricken man as best as they could, but shuddered as they did so. Stark terror seemed to cling around the gardeners, and all they touched, and the very presence of one of them in the house was a breath from regions unnamed and unnameable. Ami accompanied Nam home with the greatest reluctance and did what he might to calm the hysterical sobbing little Mirren. Zenis needed no calming. He had come of late to do nothing but stare into space and obey what his father told him, and Ami thought that his face was very merciful. Now and then, Mirren's screams were answered faintly from the attic, and in response to an inquiring look, Nam said his wife was getting very feeble. When night approached, Ami managed to get away, for not even friendship could make him stay in that spot when the faint glow of the vegetation began and the trees may or may not have swayed without wind. It was really lucky for Ami that he was not more imaginative. Even as things were, his mind was bent ever so slightly, but he had been able to connect and reflect upon all the portents around him, and he must inevitably have turned into a total maniac. In the twilight, he hastened home, the screams of the mad woman and the nervous child ringing horribly in his ears. Three days later, Nam burst into Ami's kitchen in the early morning, and in the absence of his host, stammered out a desperate tale once more, while Mrs. Pierce listened in a clutching fright. It was little Merwin this time. He was gone. He had gone out late at night with a lantern and a pail for water, and had never come back. He'd been going to pieces for days, and hardly knew what he was about. Screamed at everything. There had been a frantic shriek from the yard then, but before the father could get to the door, the boy was gone. There was no glow from the lantern he had taken, and of the child himself no trace. At the time, Nam thought the lantern and pail were gone too, but when dawn came, and the man had plodded back from his all-night search of the woods and fields, he found some very curious things near the well. There was a crushed and apparently somewhat melted mass of iron, which had certainly been the lantern, while a bent handle and twisted iron hoops beside it, both half-fused, seemed to hint at the remnants of the pail. That was all. Nam was past imagining. Mrs. Pierce was blank, and Ami, when he had reached home and heard the tale, could give no guess. Merwin was gone, and there would be no use in telling the people around, who shunned all the gardeners now. No use either in telling the city people at Arkham, who laughed at everything. Thad was gone, and now Merwin was gone. Something was creeping and creeping and waiting to be seen and heard. Nam would go soon, and he wanted Ami to look after his wife and Zenas if they survived him. It must all be a judgment of some sort, though he could not fancy what for, since he had always walked uprightly and in the Lord's ways, so as far as he knew. For over two weeks, Ami saw nothing of Nam, and then, worried about what might have happened, he overcame his fears and paid the gardener place a visit. There was no smoke from the great chimney, and for a moment, the visitor was apprehensive of the worst. The aspect of the whole farm was shocking. Grayish, withered grass and leaves on the ground, vines falling in brittle wreckage from archaic walls and gables, and great bare trees clawing up at the gray November sky with a studied malevolence which Ami could not but feel had come from some subtle change in the tilt of the branches. But Nam was alive after all. He was weak and lying on a couch in the low-sealed kitchen. But perfectly conscious and able to give simple orders to Zenas, the room was deadly cold, and as Ami visibly shivered, the host shouted huskily to Zenas for more wood. Wood, indeed, was sorely needed, since the cavernous fireplace was unlit and empty, with a cloud of soot blowing about in the chill wind that came down the chimney. Nam asked him if the extra wood had made him any more comfortable, and then Ami saw what had happened. The stoutest cord had broken at last, and the hapless farmer's mind was proof against more sorrow. Questioning tactfully, Ami could get no clear data at all about the missing Xanus. In the well, he lives in the well, was all that the clouded father would say. Then there flashed across the visitor's mind a sudden thought of the mad wife, and he changed his line of inquiry. Nabby? Why, here she is, was the surprised response of poor Nam, and Ami soon saw that he must search for himself. Leaving the harmless blabber on the couch, he took the keys from the nail beside the door and climbed up the creaking stairs to the attic. 
It was very close and noisome up there, and no sound could be heard from any direction. Of the four doors in sight, only one was locked, and on this, he tried various keys of the ring he had taken. The third key proved the right one, and after some fumbling, Amy threw open the low white door. It was quite dark inside, for the window was small and half obscured by the crude wooden bars, and Ami could see nothing at all on the wide planked floor. The stench was beyond enduring, and before proceeding further, he had to retreat to another room and return with his lungs filled with breathable air. When he did enter, he saw something in the dark corner, and upon seeing it more clearly, he screamed outright. While he screamed, he thought a momentary cloud eclipsed in the window, and a second later, he felt himself brushed as if by some hateful current of vapor. Strange colors danced before his eyes, and had not a present horror numbed him, he would have thought of the globule on the media that the geologist's hammer had shattered, and of the morbid vegetation that had sprouted in the spring. As it was, he thought of only the blasphemous monstrosity which confronted him, and which all too clearly had shared the nameless fate of young Thaddeus and the livestock. But the terrible thing about the horror was that it very slowly and perceptibly moved as it continued to crumble. Ami would give me no added particulars of this scene, but the shape in the corner does not reappear in his tale of a moving object. There are things which cannot be mentioned, and what is done in common humanity is sometimes cruelly judged by the law. I gathered that no moving thing was left in that attic room, and that to leave anything capable of motion, there would have had to been a deed so monstrous as to damn any accountable being to eternal torment. Anyone but a stolid farmer would have fainted or gone mad, but Ami walked conscious through that low doorway and locked the accursed secret behind him. There would be Nam to deal with now. He must be fed and tended and removed to some place where he could be cared for.